I'm here representing the Bronx Health and Housing Consortium, which um, is, is not a health home, but uh, we do have the four health homes in the Bronx um, in our membership, along with a variety of housing providers, um, other types of healthcare providers, and um, government agencies working in the Bronx and citywide and in the state. Um, so we organized in, in 2011, kind of with the, um, the idea to bring these, um, these different actors together and work through ways that we can streamline access for this shared population that we have um, and recognizing the overlap that, um, that exists and um, really kind of gained momentum with the implementation of the health home program as um, these new entities kind of realized the, um, um, the urgent need to um, just improve communication and collaboration across sectors um, and moving kind of beyond the, um, the somewhat siloed worlds that they had um, come from. Um, I'll also just say we have currently in our membership um, over 70 representatives from um, about 30 different nonprofit organizations and, and government agencies. So we've been pretty busy in our, our three years of existence. Um, we have a large annual meeting every year where our membership comes together, and um, it's at these meetings that um, has really driven and um, identified our agenda and what we've moved forward based on the needs that have been identified um, with organizations working in the community. So one of our earliest undertakings was um, a housing referral manual, and this um, gave kind of an overview of the different types of housing in, um, in New York, as well as uh, with a special focus on New York, New York housing, the criteria, um, eligibility, and application process. And I will say that um, you know, while this um, has been a, a helpful resource for people to, to kind of see um, what's out there, it's, uh, I think it's unrealistic to expect that um, health home care coordinators or well, um, every, any person working with this, this population is going to be able to just learn about the housing um, in, in New York. And um, I think what Shauna mentioned, their strategy to have a housing specialist um, is something that um, is really important because that's um, a burden uh, <laughs> too great to, to expect of individual people to, uh, you know, it's a really complicated system. So um, moving on, we created a sub-working group um, of the health homes in the Bronx who um, we put together a, a white pages um, as simple as just going back to knowing who to contact. So it's a directory that has all the points of contact at the at the lead health home level, um, as well as at each care management agency within the um, the network. Um, just allowing people to know um, who to contact when there's this kind of overlap of, of service providers in a person's life. Uh, we also the health homes came together and created a procedure that they could agree to as far as what to do when somebody was and one of them were assigned to multiple health homes. This was a, a big problem in the early stages of the health homes of people um, kind of enrolling in more than one. And so uh, they got together and, and created a process for how they would communicate about that. Uh, we've organized trainings for our members. Um, Kristen from CSH um, do, does an absolutely fantastic training. I hope you'll get the opportunity to see it. That really delineates the, the multitude of housing um, options that are out there, as well as explains the health homes and, and how, those, um, how those can be integrated. Um, so they kind of tested that, that training in our, our membership in December of last year and um, earlier this year. And then we really have been doing trainings on um, you know, issues pertaining to tenants' rights, housing court proceedings, um, assistance obtaining rental arrears. So, um, so just, you know, we, we provide technical assistance and trainings for, for our members um, and really for the, the frontline staff. Uh, we've done some advocacy. We testified at the um, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Planning Forum um, about the, uh, the needs, the housing needs that are out there. And um, early on, we did a lot of advocacy and, um, and work with the Department of Homeless Services to um, encourage them to acknowledge this health home program and allowing access and coordination with um, DHS's shelter information. Um, and then most recently, we've been doing research. So um, one of the things that we did on the, on the same night that New York City does its annual hope count, um, we initiated a... Uh, um, an account at the at some partnering hospitals in the Bronx to really kind of under you know see and understand this this hidden homeless population of people who are um, in the hospitals in the EDs and inpatient beds as kind of this um, housing option of last resort. So um, 
So we kicked that off, and then additionally, we, um, we did a study of the Bronx Health Homes um, earlier this year, and um, I'm going to share some of the results of that, of that study. So the, um, the study we partnered with CSH and, um, and worked with three health homes in the Bronx to collect data about their members. It was the Community Care Management Partners, which is led by VNS, the Bronx Health Home, which is co-led by Bronx Lebanon and CDC, and the Bronx Accountable Health Care Network, which is led by Montefiore Hospital. So we did a quantitative data sample, uh, which included 428 individuals, and a quantitative data sample of 13 case studies, uh, which we got from the Bronx Health Home and the Bronx Accountable Health Care Network. So going back a little bit, um, at our December 2013 meeting, we asked the health homes to present data on, um, on how, what percentage of their members had responded yes to the, um, the health home functional questionnaire, um, question HH6, which is, um, you know, I am homeless. And then the state is a DOH standard form for those in the health home world. Um, you'd be familiar with it. And the, the definition of homeless in this scenario is, um, includes people living in shelter as well as those living on someone's couch. And what we found was that an average of 21% of enrolled health home members uh, self-reported as homeless. So at this, um, at the same meeting, uh, DOH was, was there and presented um, updated information on, on health home enrollments in the Bronx and reported um, at the time 7,743 um, people to be enrolled in, in health homes. So if we're looking at 21% of, of those enrolled members, um, that's over 1,600 people who identify as homeless. And even assuming that maybe half of that um, would not need um, housing. You're still looking at over 800 units that would be required for, for this population alone. And to give a picture, when the, you know, the MRT um, housing came out, 50 units were allocated to the Bronx. And um, all of those were scattered site and for single adults. So uh, we're really starting to see the magnitude of these housing issues um, that um, are, are you know, not being met. Uh, so it's more demographic information and um, it's more at, at who are these people are that are in the health homes. And we looked at the current living arrangements. So uh, the largest portion, uh, 30%, uh, live with family and friends. Um, next, that 28% of people live in uh, rental apartments of their own. And 22% are living in shelter. So I mean, the, the remaining 20% are divided between uh, three-quarter housing, SROs, public housing, residential facilities, and those that are street homeless. So you're looking at a, a really large portion of the, um, this population that um, when, you, when you incorporate and add in the, the fact that they have complex and chronic medical conditions, um, creates a, a really unstable environment, for, particularly for people living with family and friends um, that uh, can sometimes, their patients can wear thin when there is complex medical and mental health issues happening. We also looked at family composition and found that 28% of members um, are not singles. So we have 15% who are living with children under the age of 15, 9% um, are in two adult households, and 4% are living with you know, adult children over the age of 18. So while the majority, we have 72% that are singles, um, it's, a, it's a large portion that um, are families, and again, the housing that was made available through MRT was all for single adults, um, as well as the New York, New York housing that's available is predominantly for singles. So um, there's, a, there's a bit of a crisis here for families and, and lack of options who may not um, qualify or um, need the supports of, of supportive housing, but are not able to afford market rate rent and, um, and where they fall. So now, you know, I've thrown a lot of numbers and statistics at you, so you have to kind of put a face on, on who we're talking about here. So I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of two case studies that came through um, through the study that we did in the Bronx, and, and then I'm going to hand it back to, to Kristen to lead kind of an interactive discussion. So the first person, is a, she's a 41-year-old female living with her 10-year-old son. She has diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and undiagnosed depression, but has refused to see a psychiatrist. She has past trauma that has made her distrustful of men and social workers. 
and um, is currently living with her son in shelter, but previously they had been squatting in an uninhabitable building uh, for close to two years before it burned down, and they've gone back and forth between shelter and staying with friends and family. And uh, being on fixed income, she is unable to afford a market rate rent. The next study is um, a 32-year-old female living with her husband. She has bipolar disorder, asthma, and obesity, and abuses tobacco. She has a history of incarceration, which caused her to, um, to lose the custody of her children. And she lives with her husband in a small, poorly ventilated room um, that's infested with rats and has a shared bathroom and, and kitchen um, with other people in the house. Um, the poor quality of housing has been affecting her health. She spends most of her time at home um, and often smoking, uh, smoking tobacco inside this, this room. And her criminal history has limited her options for um, affordable housing. So um, I'm going to jump back to the case studies and just um, just finish up with um, sharing some best practices of um, of what we've been doing in the Bronx with our, our membership. You know, um, the the role that the consortium has has played is really to help build these um, you know strategic alliances, these partnerships um, between different organizations in order to better improve the services that we can provide. So um, Montefiore Medical Center operates a, um, a housing at risk program which has certain information flagged in their electronic medical records. So you have people who are, who are known to the system to be homeless um, are flagged in there, as well as specific addresses, shelter addresses, um, supportive housing residences, drop-in centers, and, um, and specific PCPs that people work with. So any time somebody comes in presenting with this, um, you know, showing their address, as a shelter, it's going to be flagged in the system, and an automated alert is going to go to the um, emergency department social worker on staff. So this all happens in real time. The social worker gets that alert and is able to connect with the medical needs and the, the housing needs at once. We also um, make referrals to um, the MIT housing and um, have monthly case conferences for high-utilizing patients and um, communicate with the Department of Homeless Services on, on complex cases. Bronx Works, um, who I mentioned before, also has a, it's called a Hospitals to Home Initiative. And um, in here they have a designated coordinator who has gone out and built relationships with the hospitals in the Bronx and identified uh, points of contact and, and serves as a point of contact so that when uh, one of Bronx Works' clients is brought to, um, to the hospital, they know who that they can contact there to, um, to be involved in the care plan and, and the discharge plan, ultimately. Because this coordinator is a resource for the hospital staff, so when somebody comes into their ER who they suspect might be homeless or they need more information on their, their homeless history, they're able to contact this, this coordinator at Bronx Works and... Um, all those. <laughs> And, 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 that, um, and, and get information um, that would help them in their, in their care. And then finally, uh, Bank Lebanon, um, in their health home, created a, um, a flag for all of their health home members, those that are enrolled, as well as those um, still in outreach, have been entered into their, um, their EMR and are flagged. So at any time, if they show up at the, at the ER or admitted to the hospital, um, another um, alert is sent out, and it goes to the health home's medical director. It goes to the, the patient navigator um, in the ED at that time, as well as the designated health home care coordinator, um, which may be you know, a different agency. So that instantly, everyone on the team knows that that, that client, um, that member, is at the, is at the emergency room and, again, can coordinate services. So, again, that, that seems to be the theme here with all of these programs. It's about creating systems to improve communication, to be able to collaborate across sectors and, um, and ultimately improve the care that we're providing. And um, I have additional contact information. I realize that this is not my most up-to-date <laughs> presentation, so, um, but um, there's, there's contact information that I have. If anybody would like to know more information about any of these programs, you can find me after, and I'll give you the, the person who can um, give you more information about that. So, with that, I will um, bring it back to the case studies for Kristen. Thank you.